we just have a few more people joining on and then we'll then we'll get started. Everyone, thank you for joining us for the third of the Marine Fishery Series. We are really excited to have you here. The first two, we had a southern flounder one and then we had a shrimp trawling one. Thank you all for joining us for the tragedy of the commons and I'll turn it over to Dr. Lewis Daniel and he'll get us rolling today. Thanks, Tara, and uh, welcome everybody. We're glad you could join us today for the third of our webinar series on marine fisheries and the Sound Solutions Program. Um, I'm very delighted to have with me today um, a student at the North Carolina State Seamast uh, Program here in Moorhead City. Um, Sydney's one of my intern for the semester and she's been working on an issue on the issues of the tragedy of the commons and the public trust doctrine um, and how that affects management and the like in North Carolina. So Sydney Zimmerman, a uh, sophomore at North Carolina State and myself um, are going to be presenting to you today um, just sort of the background and history behind the tragedy of the commons and the public trust doctrine and, and how it may be impacting um, North Carolina and some examples that uh, we believe are relevant. So the first part of the presentation will be Sydney, who's going to go over uh, the definitions and sort of get get us going on the de de defining the, the tragedy and the and the public trust doctrine. So Sydney. So we're going to talk about the tragedy of the commons and the public trust doctrine, and most importantly, the tragedy of the public trust. So the tragedy of the commons is a growing problem that occurs when a resource is usable by everyone and lacks regulations. Garrett Hardin was an author and ecologist, and he was the first to give a title to this term. And he describes the tragedy as something that occurs when populations grow and overuse limited resources. So open accessibility to these resources often leads to them being overused to the point of depletion or damage and poor regulation or a lack of it is what furthers the tragedy. So here's an example of how the tragedy occurs. There's a resource that individuals use and there's no regulations on the resource. So then it starts to become depleted until the point where it is no longer available or usable. Here's an image that I think depicts the tragedy very well. Um, eventually, this water source will be empty because the water has been taken at a rate faster than it can naturally refill itself. This means not everyone will get a fair use of this resource, and this is a perfect example of what the tragedy looks like. The public trust is a state obligation to hold and preserve a resource for long-term use just as any other trust would do. It gives states regulatory power over resources, promises the long-term availability of these resources, and grants the people of North Carolina to use and enjoy these resources. A good quote from the Coastal Conservation Association says, it imposes on the state a legal duty to hold and manage and trust for the benefit of its current and future citizens, all of North Carolina's public trust resources. So how do these two relate? The failure to follow the trust is what leads to a tragedy of the commons. And there are different interpretations of what the trust's duty is, which can create halts in regulation and management decisions, which makes tragedies worse and more likely to occur. So, in conclusion, there are social and economic consequences that come with mismanaging shared resources. An equal and fair distribution of shared resources is vital, and the duty to protect and rebuild these resources, if not properly protected, is equally distributed when managed correctly. Thanks, Sydney. Um, I've, I've taught this. I've taught this topic and we've discussed this topic in, in my class for the last five years. And, and I've always had a hard time um, explaining it as simply as I can. And, and the example I use is a is a is the classic Garrett Hardin uh, example where there was a field that was a common. It was allowed it was available for anybody to graze their cattle. And most people had two cows and that pasture land could handle enough for everybody to have two cows and so a gentleman comes in with 10 cows and the resource is depleted and the cows are no longer able to survive and so 
where the tragedy comes in and where it really gets complicated and interesting from my perspective is that person with 10 cows benefits greatly from overuse of the resource. At the end, when they've all stopped feeding and they have to sacrifice their cows, everyone has two, except for the guy who over harvested who's got 10. And so he's he's benefited from the from the over harvest. But now everybody has to equally pay for the rebuilding. And I think that's the classic example of the tragedy. So it occurs in all resources, I believe. Um, but what we're particularly interested in here and in my class on marine resource management and policy is what is termed the second commons. And this was coined by a guy from San Diego State in the law department there who looked at ways to avert the tragedy. And I've read many, many documents on this issue, and I think he summarizes it better than anyone else that I have seen. And what he does is he goes in and he talks about the three things that are critically important in order to avert a tragedy of the commons. One is a dominant use agency. <clears throat> And what that means in his language is that you have a group that makes the decisions who have no vested interest in the outcome. So anyone that has anyone that has a, a, a significant relationship with the industry would not be on the deciding board. They are completely removed from any influence and make that decision on what is in the best interest of the resource. And for marine resources, those don't really exist. Um, and I think trying to develop a dominant use agency would be a very difficult thing to do. I think the closest thing we might have to a dominant use agency would be if marine resources were managed by the Wildlife Resources Commission, who has more broad sweeping authority over all the resources of the state from the mountains to the coast. But right now, there is no example that I can provide on a dominant use agency. The other issue, the other way to avert the tragedy is through marine protected areas. And at the time of this article, there was discussion that about 40 percent of the bottom of the ocean needed to be set aside as a marine protected area in order to protect these areas. That has not occurred. The, the number, the amount of marine protected areas in the coastal areas of this coast are extremely small and pretty ineffectual in terms of rebuilding resources and having any quantifiable effect on the rebuilding of those resources. So until we get really serious about marine protected areas and close off extraordinarily large areas that will have significant impacts on behavior, um, marine protected areas is probably one of the few, one of the least likely things that we'll be able to do. And finally, he uses individual transferable quotas. And that's an, that's an avenue that is available. And it is something that is very unpopular with some folks and very popular with others. And what that means is, is that you receive a share of a quota and you are allowed to catch that quota anytime you want to. And that's very appealing to some harvesters. The, the fact that they don't have to go out and race for fish. They don't have a quota set aside and they know there's a start date and the, the market gets swamped with fish. And there's a lot of benefits to individual transferable quotas. And we talk about that in class in great detail. But I recognize through my background in history that the chances of us moving forward with an individual transferable quota is pretty remote at this with this climate. And that's unfortunate. But the, the, the next level is a hard managed quota. Um, I really believe that any management plan that doesn't have specific total allowable catches that account for all the non-harvest losses, account for all the bycatch and discard mortality, reduce the allowable landings down to the reasonable level required by the stock assessment, and manage the resource that way, we're not gonna see rebuilding. And sort of the proof is in the pudding 
and and what we have seen with the federal fisheries management that now have federal law that require accountability measures and quotas we're starting to see those resources rebuild and recover despite concerns with water quality and habitat loss and other things which are certainly real issues if you stop killing the fish they will come back and that seems to be bearing out in the federal fishery management plans unlike the state's plans or even the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission plans that don't have that same requirement and oftentimes get afoul of, of state's issues when trying to develop fishery management plans. So I wanted to go through and give just a couple of examples on what we've seen from a lack of management on many of these marine resources in North Carolina. Um, Atlantic croaker, we used to, North Carolina, we used to land uh, 20 to 30 million pounds of Atlantic croaker um, every year. There are essentially no regulations on Atlantic croaker. Um, there's no size limit, there's no bag limit, there's no trip limit, there's no gear limits. Um, the only thing that could possibly be considered as management actions that have been taken to benefit Atlantic croaker has been the fly net closure south of Cape Hatteras and the shrimp trawl bycatch reduction devices. Based on the stock assessments and based on this landings trend, where you can see a fairly sizable drop, especially in the commercial landings over the last 20 years, neither of those actions have shown any quantifiable results. And so as Sydney was talking about the lack of evidence, the lack of, of regulations, the lack of man management has created this tragedy where we have lost access to these public trust resources because of our failure to manage them properly. Another good example is spot. Again, only managed through, really through the bycatch reduction devices in the shrimp trawl fishery, which as we talked about in the former rev webinar, there's, there's not a lot of evidence that there's been any quantifiable benefit from those reduction devices. And spot really weren't affected that as nearly as much as the fly net closure south of Cape Hatteras. And so again, we see this dramatic decline of greater than 80% in the spot fishery um, over the last several decades, certainly since the Fisheries Reform Act was implemented. And then finally, sort of the poster child of, of collapse in a fishery and, and, and overfishing and the lack of, of substantive regulations is the weak fish fishery that's declined, landings have declined by 99% since their peak in the 80s. Um, the, fish are, the fishery is essentially extinct for economic purposes and bag limits are one fish and trip limits are 100 pounds. But the, the, number one, the stock was driven down to such a low level. But secondly, I believe that the, the bycatch associated with the shrimp trawl fishery and others compound uh, the, the difficulties they have in, re, in re being restored. So really what we've seen as a, as a result of these this these lack of, of restrictions and nibbling around the edges to avoid on regulations to avoid having um, any substantive social or economic impact is pretty telling. And um, we see the, the looking at a, a, a list of the primary species that were occurring and the top species in 96 compared to present. Um, we've seen huge reductions. Um, in, in the overall decline. Croakers from 10 million pounds at the time of the Fisheries Reform Act to now are 1.6 million pounds. Um, Southern flounder that were 3.8 million pounds at the time of the Fisheries Reform Act, now less than, less than 800,000 pounds and managed by a quota. And we haven't been able to meet the quota. We've exceeded the quota both years it's been available. Um, and so, and blue crab, the blue crab fishery, great example of a tragedy of the commons is the blue crab fishery where the landings in, 60, in 96 were 65 million pounds. Um, those landings have declined to 16. And it's kind of like the cow example. Everybody was making a living with three, 400 pots. Um, and as the resource declined, the number of pots had to go up. And now there, there are many folk, there are folks that are, that are fishing as many as 1500 pots. Um, in order to make up for the loss of the resource and make up for that. And that's, that's been a tragedy. So what must we do? We've, we've, we've talked about this in the previous um, 
webinars. We, 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 we certainly need shrimp trial reform um, through Amendment 2 to the Shrimp Fishery Management Plan ongoing. Um, still let them spawn. Um, any aspects of let them spawn that, that, that can allow these fishes to, to at least spawn one time before they're harvested. And, and a bulk of the bycatch and the majority of the mortality of the species that I gave as examples, the bulk of that mortality is on juvenile fish before they have a chance to spawn. Um, marine fisheries license reform to make sure that it, those commercial fishermen that make a living fishing as opposed to folks that just like to use commercial gear needs to occur. And then obviously to, to, to abide with the second commons, um, we've got to have strict allowable catch limits that account for all the non-harvest losses. Reduce capacity. We got too many people trying to catch too many fish and address regulatory capture. We've got to make the management decisions at the commission and the division level in what's on the best interest of the resource and not necessarily the economic drivers um, of the resource because a healthy resource um, is a benefit to all North Carolinians, both commercial, recreational, and the folks that just like to know that there are fish out there swimming around. So that's our brief presentation, um, Tara. Um, be happy to try to answer any questions um, that anyone may have. Great, thank you both. That was that was wonderful. I'm sure we all learned a lot from that. Um, so I just want to remind everyone, if you have a question, you can raise your hand by using the little raise hand icon, or you can put your question in the chat by clicking the blurb symbol and the conversation area. So you have two options there, um, and we'd be happy to answer any of those questions. So we'll give everyone um, a minute or so for that. Lewis, what's your experience been with the public trust doctrine? Um, can you kind of elaborate on that as the prior director and the assistant director for 20 years? Um, if you could elaborate a bit on that for us, that'd be, that'd be great. Sure, Tara, thanks. Um, yeah, the, the, the my, my understanding when I first became assistant director and, and then director, the, there was a book left on my desk when I walked in for the first day and it was the public trust in North Carolina. And the former director was extreme, extremely strong proponent of the public trust. And it was driven into my head that the resources of this state are a public trust and that it was our responsibility to manage them for sustainability and for health. And I think it's been consistent across the time that I was in the division that fishery management plans such as the clam plan, the oyster plan, the sea mullet, the kingfish plan, the flounder plan, the shrimp plan, all talk about the importance of managing for the public trust resources. Unfortunately, there seems to be a disconnect now between the responsibilities of the state to manage for the public trust. And that's an ongoing issue um, that I think is unfortunate and that there is no responsibility. What we're hearing is there is no responsibility to manage for the best interest of the public trust resources. It's really more access to public trust waters, which is inconsistent with everything that I ever learned about the public trust. And it's inconsistent with the mission of the division. And it's inconsistent from my read with many of these fishery management plans that talk about that. And so if the issue is resolved to the, in the favor of the state who is saying in a certain issue that the public trust, the, the state has no responsibility to manage for the public trust fishery resource sustainability, that that is certainly, I think, an opinion that is not shared with the vast of the stakeholders, vast number of the stakeholders. I think anybody, you ask anybody about the public trust and you assume that that means there is a responsibility to manage these resources for sustainability. And so that's an issue that's ongoing. Um, and we have worked with that in on that issue and provided technical advice on that issue. Um, but again, I, I believe we do. I believe our 
state does have a, 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 a fiduciary responsibility to manage the public trust for what's in the best interest of the public, not a specific sector of the public, or otherwise you end up with, as, as Sidney aptly described it, a tragedy of the public trust. And I don't know how you can look at, I don't know how you can look at the failure of the Fisheries Reform Act to rebuild a single fish stock over 24 years as not a failure of the public trust. And when you combine that failure to rebuild any fish stock to recovery with the unbelievable declines in the harvest of these fish and the truncation of the age structure and the extraordinarily poor condition that the vast majority of these resources are in as a result of the Fisheries Reform Act makes one wonder if we shouldn't make some changes to the Fisheries Reform Act. And just think for those that can recall back to 94, 95, 96, before the Fisheries Reform Act, we thought it was bad then and said we needed this Fisheries Reform Act to rebuild the overfished stocks at the time. And they've, and they've further declined by an additional 70 to 90% since then. So I don't know how it can be more of a tragedy than what we're what we're seeing here in North Carolina, and I, I offer the students extra credit if they can provide an example of a tragedy that's worse than the North Carolina fisheries tragedy. And and most of the time they talk about water law, water 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 resources, and and plastics in the ocean, but nobody can give a, a better example of the fisheries tragedies that I believe are occurring here. Long-winded answer to an easy question, but thank that's you, Lewis. No, that was that was wonderful. And we do have a question: Do you have any ideas on how we can change the DMF missions to address the need for regulatory change? Is there another U.S. state that we should try to emulate? Who is who is doing it right? What is it going to take to address this issue? I there's so many things at this point that I think need to be need to be changed. And yes, there are other states that can emulate. I, I think the, the, the state of Florida that has combined their agencies and have a specific research branch to where you don't have the managers sitting down and reviewing the science. The, the scientists provide the science and and the actions are taken based exclusively on the science. I think that has to be done. I think. I think providing impacts, for example, a good example of that, Tara, is the Fisheries Reform Act says we must rebuild a stock in 10 years. We must end overfishing and rebuild in 10 years from the date of adoption of the plan. So we were supposed to be, have Southern Flounder was supposed to be rebuilt in 2015. We didn't do it. We failed. There were no ramifications for that. So nothing happened. And for three years or four years, no new regulations were even implemented until 2019. And a new plan came out to just extend the overfish, the, the rebuilding deadline to 2028. So now we're talking about 23 years to rebuild a fish that really doesn't get much over seven or eight years old. There are no implications that there should be if you fail to if you fail to rebuild in 10 years you got to reduce harvest by 50 percent in the case of southern flounder the fishery needs to be closed there's so few fish available to harvest that there shouldn't be a fishery or it should be a bycatch only fishery but we're moving forward trying to figure out how to open a fishery with just a fraction of the fish that are really necessary to drive the fishery so i think wholesale changes need to be made to the fisheries reform act the, the reliance on science, reliance on and, and removing the, the, the basically what is a prohibition on individual transferable quotas. Um, that is a problem in the Fisheries Reform Act. Um, and we need the support from folks to express to their legislators that it's time for a change before we run out of these fisheries altogether. I hope that answered the question. 
Thanks, Lewis. I think sure. it did. Um, if there's a follow up question to that, do we need to find ways to economically support commercial fishermen? There was a follow up question. And then we have a hand raised too that we'll we'll get to. That's a that's a great question. And that's a that's been a philosophical issue that's been raised many, many times. I mean, is there an obligation to compensate folks for not harvesting a public trust resource? Uh, that that's an important question that is not resolved. Um, if the commercial fishermen or the recreational fishermen don't catch fish, then there are more fish in the ocean for the public trust. But if a farmer doesn't plant his crops, we don't have crops. And there are differences between buyouts, so to speak, that people talk about paying people not to a harvest public trust resource is one that raises a, a huge uh, uh, red flag to some people and creates some real arguments. How to resolve that, I don't know. Um, there have been discussions on buyouts um, to pay fishermen not to fish, um, to buy gear, um, to buy licenses, um, to provide them with a softer landing um, if resources are are reduced to a point. But I think we have to look at the ideology of those reductions and why they occurred. And, you know, it's a failure. It's been a failure of the state to implement the regulations. It's not been a failure of the commercial or recreational fishermen from abiding by the law. So we can't hold it, hold, hold it against the commercial and recreational fishermen for simply following the rules and regulations implemented by the state. They're just doing what they're asked, what they've been told they can do. And there should not be any hard feelings about that from anyone. The responsibility for properly managing these rests with the state. And so whether the state feels that it should compensate these fishermen for its failure to properly manage the resource is certainly a decision that needs to be made at a much higher political level than, than us sit here around the table. Thanks, Lewis. And we have a Robert Powell hand, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Robert. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah, I think that uh, the man that owns the 10 cows is in charge of making the rules. And I wonder if you could explain the relationship between the two commissions, the Marine Fisheries Commission, Division of Marine Fisheries, so why do we need both of them? Where is the bottleneck that's preventing the reform that we need? What do we need to attack to? One of those commissions probably needs to be put out of business or uh, we talked about merging it with the uh, Wildlife Commission, but uh, just tell us where the bottleneck is. Well, the, I think I don't, I, well, it, they're, they're two distinctly different commissions. The Wildlife Resources Commission is appointed, has members appointed by the Senate pro tem, uh, the speaker, and the governor. And so there's that that, const, that suggests that there's buy-in from the legislature and the governor's office and the appointments of the, of the Wildlife Resources Commissioners. And they, sem they basically represent a region across the state. So they don't have specific seats they sit in other than their region. And they're expected to have some knowledge and understanding of fish and wildlife. Um, so it's a fairly, low bar to to cross to become a, a member of the wildlife resources commission and and so but at, but in the marine fisheries commission the F fisheries reform act selects gives nine seats there are nine seats on the commission that are all appointed by the governor three have to be commercial fishermen that make at least 50 percent of their income on from commercial fishing Two are at-large members who just have to have a general interest in marine fisheries issues. Three are recreational fishermen, one of whom has to be from the recreational industry who makes his living off of recreational fishing, and one scientist. And so you've automatically, you've automatically completely discounted the dominant use agency definition in the, in the definition of the Marine Fisheries Commission. And there's substantive uh, bias. I think is the best word to use 
um, on certain issues. And folks are not going to gore the ox that feeds them. They're not going to do things that are going to hurt the folks in their communities and their neighborhoods. And so it, it, it puts the social and the economic consequences of action in the forefront. And that's not what happens from my perspective as frequently with the Wildlife Resources Commission. It seems to be an agency that provides a whole lot more support for the, the resource itself. Now, sure, they get into some political things with dog hunting and various other things. But when it comes down to the resource, they tend to be more more receptive to sustainability as opposed to short term economic need. Um, so that's why the North Carolina Wildlife Federation Board has directed uh, a position that uh, we support one commission, one mission, one commission to to rebuild, restore and manage all of the public trust resources of this state from from elk in the mountains to 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 southern flounder on the artificial reefs in the wintertime. Um, that would be that would be a short term economic hit to some in the commercial fishing industry. And I think the the primary drivers of the regulations that are being promulgated, and this is just my opinion, is from the, the, the commercial leadership. Um, I think if you talk to individual commercial fishermen, the idea of slot limits, the idea of individual quotas, the idea of opportunities are, are very favorable, but they're not to the folks that run the, 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 the show. And so until we can somehow provide a, a, a scenario where the decisions are made based on what's in the best interest of the resource, then I don't see a way that those things are going to be corrected even in the long term. And that's why the Sound Solutions Program with the Federation, in my opinion, is so critical to address, we're, we're, our, our Sound Solutions Program addresses every single one of these issues. And there's a solution to the problem if we can get it through the legislature. And I don't think it's going to happen with the current Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, and that's why the only hope, I think, is legislation and one commission. Thank you, Lewis. And that was a great question. Um, I don't see any more questions currently. Um, just going to take a look. If anyone has any pending questions, this would be the time to ask them. We can direct them afterwards over to our speakers, but um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask right now, feel free to get those up there. Um, so I guess just to kind of conclude this whole series, we had a discussion on the Southern Flounder. We had a shrimp trawling talk, um, and now we're having this, this talk here. Can, can you guys conclude this whole series and list some of the like takeaways for everyone who is on here? Um, what, what can we take away with us today? A few, a few main points, Lewis. Oh, um, I, I, I think we have a tragedy of the public trust. We're not Man, we're nibbling around the edges of management. We're not taking the necessary action to address the mortality issues associated with marine fisheries in North Carolina. And I think all you have to look at is the fact that there are no fish available for a flounder season that's being developed. We, we've caught all the fish. And going over the quotas in 2019 and 2020, five Following Amendment 2, we've over, we're probably still overfishing 20 years later, 20 years from the 15 years after the plan was implemented, we're still overfishing Southern Flounder, I would bet. Now, some will argue we're not overfishing, but we're a far cry from being rebuilt. And based on my review, which I would be happy to have any discussion with anybody that would like to have that discussion. I don't believe there's any way Amendment 3 is going to rebuild by the 28th deadline based on the Amendment 3 document I've seen so far. 
Shrimp trawl bycatch is the well-known, most established source of mortality on the East Coast for virtually all the species that we manage as a state, many of the species that we manage as a state. All the other states have addressed this issue by taking shrimp trawls out of their nursery areas. We won't do it. We just continue because of tradition, because of culture, because of economics, for whatever reason. We don't even want to reduce the amount of trawling effort in our nursery areas. That's all we've asked for, is to minimize the impacts, reduce the impacts, not to prohibit commercial fishing, not to prohibit shrimp trawling, but to manage it properly and provide areas where these, where, where these fishes can go and not be subjected to shrimp trawl by catch, be able to go out into the ocean and join the spawning stock biomass and at least spawn one time before they die. The vast majority, and, and I'll conclude with this, the shrimp trawl fishery is a small juvenile fish bycatch fishery. Shrimp is a bycatch to the juvenile fish. The dominant catch in the shrimp trawl fishery are juvenile fishes of economic importance to commercial and recreational fisheries. Shrimp trawl is about a fourth. Shrimp are about a fourth of the catch of the shrimp trawls. The rest is all discarded by catch the vast majority of which do not survive. As long as we're killing a billion fish a year while we're trying to rebuild these fish stocks, we're not gonna see any improvement. And so the only way to fix this is through legislative action, through people writing their legislators, people writing their congressmen, people writing the director, people writing the governor and telling them we've had enough. We've got to do something to get us off the dime or else the, these resources are not going to be there for the future. And we already see so many people leaving North Carolina to go fishing in other places. We're, the economic losses that are occurring in this state as a result of our failure to manage these resources properly is sad. And especially when you look at the economic condition of the coastal counties of North Carolina are so depauperate. We could be the destination for marine fisheries in this country. And now we're becoming a fourth or fifth choice um, because of the way we've managed these resources. And I firmly believe that. Um, and uh, it's the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing now. So I appreciate everybody's support. Thank you, Lewis. Um, that was yeah an inspiring chat there. And actually, while while you were speaking, I think it was so great that we actually got four questions in while you were speaking. Oh, <laughs> so, no. <laughs> um, so yes, it seems the state's response to their PTD responsibility that the people should just be willing to accept what they get. I, you know, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV. So it's hard for me to talk too much about the, the legal issues that are going on with all of that. Um, you know, suffice it to say that the, 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 the charge is that these resources have not been managed for the public trust. And I believe that. And from my layman's review of the state's response, it's kind of like, you know, we're the only ones that can make a call about the public trust and there's nothing you can do about it. That scares me because I've been thinking all along what it says in the what it says in the in the in the opening salvo of the division's website on fisheries management. It says the hold on just one second. In North Carolina. Coastal fish are a public trust resource and belong to the citizens of the state as a whole. Now, that's the way I've understood we manage resources in North Carolina since I started in 1995. That doesn't seem to be the law, according to 
some lawyers. I don't agree with that, but I can't argue it from a legal perspective. But the fact is, they are a public trust resource. And if we find out that we don't have a right to expect these resources to be managed properly, then we need to do something about it to change that. Because it could be changed. The law could be changed to address this response that I find troubling. Great, thank you, Lewis. Um, and we'll go over to a raised hand. We have Lou Candle. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I live in Salisbury and I've always, I've fished in the coast since 1980, different areas. And I also travel in other areas of the country. But the, the one, I was in Beaufort and more in um, Moorhead City a couple of years ago and with a bunch of buddies and uh, we went to seafood restaurants one after the other uh, trying to find uh, uh, what would be on their menu that was local local fish and we found absolutely nothing and my question and and that was just not more than more than a couple places everything was imported the shrimp were from somewhere and it this and that but my question is have, is the restauranteurs, the owners of these businesses, are they understanding what's happening to their menus and their businesses? And if they don't, may, maybe they would be one of the people who would back back what worked, what you all are trying to do, and back them economically. And maybe the politicians would listen to these folks who have these restaurants serving food, fish from. Asia and everywhere else. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's that's a real good point. It's it, it gets into the social and economic aspects of this stuff, which I don't purport to be a an expert on. But but just from my reviews and the things that I have seen, you know, a lot of times outside sources, the Gulf, South America, Central America, can provide a consistent product throughout the year. And that's what many of these restaurants are looking for. They're looking for something that they can be assured that they're going to have nice six ounce portions of dolphin fillets available all the time. When really the commercial fishery operates primarily in May for, for mahi mahi or dolphin, whatever you want to call it. You know, shrimp the same way. You know, they have to have a consistent source of shrimp to have it on their menu and serve the volumes that they serve. And so, yes, it's true that you can go to the, you can go to the waterfront in Moorhead City and go to a, a, a local restaurant and ask if the shrimp are fresh local North Carolina shrimp, and they'll say no, they come from the Gulf. That happened to me last week. Um, so, yeah, I mean the 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 and and North Carolina seafood has a premium on it, so it, it's not accessible to as many folks. I mean, I've seen the grouper prices is going to 16 17 dollars a pound and it's great for the commercial fishermen i mean it's wonderful to see those resources bring in that type of money but whether or not the the fact that there's the seasons and the availability in north carolina um, is episodic sometimes um, the restaurants they have to have a different source and so it's good that they're honest to say no these are it's fresh frozen or it's fresh frozen from the gulf um, you know, and, and, and so that's a very difficult thing. It raises the question, you know, of what would happen if we took a break from production for a couple of years to get this fisheries, these fisheries back in gear, you know, if, if there were more abundant resources for the commer for commercial harvest, would they be able to satisfy more of the local market and see more of that local product on the coastal area, in the coastal areas, particularly, um, so yeah, it's it's a big issue, but I think it's one that has it's been stated that that, that it's such a critical aspect of the industry um, on the coast. But many many reports are similar to the ones you said, where you don't see a lot of the fresh local seafood, except for in very remote locations or very small places where they have exclusively North Carolina seafood. We just have to keep working towards that. Great, thank you. And that was a great question. That definitely got us all thinking, Lou. So thank you for that. Um, and we had a question. Can you describe the responsibility of the Division of Marine Fisheries? 
Well, <laughs> when I can describe it, when I was director, um, we were the recommenders and the Marine Fisheries Commission was the decider. And we made an effort to put together science-based um, arguments um, and provide, present those to the Marine Fisheries Commission um, so that the commission could make the, uh, an informed decision. Um, but if the commission failed to take the recommendations of the division, there was really no recourse. And that's what happened with Southern Flounder in 2005 when the division recommended a, a, a November 3rd closure to achieve a 30% reduction in harvest, which would have rebuilt the fishery, the commission felt that that was too onerous and went with a December 1 closure, which only achieved about a three or 4% reduction. And now we're in a spot where we need probably closer to a 90% reduction in order to rebuild the fishery. You know, outside of you know, Marine Patrol, Resource enhancement, they're responsible for permitting and, and pound net permits and aquaculture permits and, and shellfish leases and constructing artificial reefs. Um, there's a license and statistics pro pro program that, that is responsible for compiling data on recreational and commercial catches, the trip ticket program and various other things. The fisheries management section, which is sort of the bread and butter section, at least from as far as what the issues we're concerned with, they go out and collect the data on these fish and they attempt stock assessments to, to tell us what are the problems and what are the issues that we're supposed to, to address. And so what's happened now, it seems, is that the division is provides recommendations to the commission, but there doesn't seem to be much of an avenue for the commission to change that um, if they don't like it. So it's an interesting change that I don't know how that occurred, but you know the, what I keep hearing from members of the commission is, is that in order to change the division's recommendation, you have to have a super majority of the commissioners agree. And I don't think you could ever, you could, I don't think you could get the commissioners to have a super majority on when to adjourn, much less on a, on a substantive management issue. So I, I how it's working now is very different. At least what I hear and see, what, what I see is very different from when I was the director five years ago. Um, and uh, uh, makes it very difficult from what I can see for, we had a commissioner raise a concern during a commission meeting, um, scientist on the commission raised a concern about some technical issues about flounder and was admonished by the division for bringing it up and said it was inappropriate to have sprung that on them. Well, when else would be the appropriate time for the scientists to raise a concern to the Marine Fisheries Commission other than at a commission meeting? And that concern is a very valid technical concern and it still hadn't been addressed. So I don't know whether it will be addressed or not. So, it's a tough situation. I mean, it's a very, very, I, I, I can't explain what's going on over there now. Unfortunately. Thanks, Lewis. We have two more questions. We have a hand from Bob Toby, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Actually, I think you're unmuted. Go for it. Uh, yes, I'm ready to go. Uh, I understand this problem and, uh, you know, that the shrimp is just a uh, uh, 40 percent or whatever of the, the catch and the rest are trash uh is that the same and that's in the, in the sounds would that also be the case if you were in open waters uh, out in the ocean off the coast of north carolina and south carolina oh man that's a great question um yeah the the states of south carolina georgia and florida pushed their shrimpers offshore um years ago and i think that does have an impact um, because when those when those look when the shrimpers are operating in the pamlico sound those fish really don't have anywhere to go and so there are not many escape routes and there are not many places they can go and avoid being trawled and certainly not travel and not and avoid being trawled. Um, they can go into grass beds where you can't trawl, but they got to move out of the grass beds and get to the ocean. And so by having trawling activity occurring throughout that area and right on the coastal beaches, right in the inlets, that's the corridors that these fish leave. And they're small fish. And many of the fishes are about the same size as the shrimp. And that's one of the reasons why you don't see a lot of reduction in the bycatch, even with the bycatch reduction devices, again, that we've talked about. 
when you get offshore, it's a much op more broadly opened area. The, the, the shrimp probably segregate more there. In the Pamlico Sound, the shrimp and the fish are together. When they get in the ocean, I believe that the shrimp segregate somewhat and the fish don't just hang with the shrimp because there's plenty of room, number one. The fish are a little bigger, so they can avoid the trawls to some degree. They're also more active and can get out of the get out of the gear, you know, swim away from the gear. And I believe that there are more areas that are not trawlable out there that these fish can get to. And once they get to those areas, they're protected and safe. So I can't tell you that shrimp trawl bycatch is not a problem in federal waters three miles offshore and further from the federal fleets. But I do believe that it is far less an issue and far less impactful on individual species than trawling right in the heart of the nursery area. That, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thanks, Lois. And we have one more question. Do the overfishing rebuilding parallel the, the bison in the 1700s, 1800s? Did overfishing imperil the bison? Do the overfishing rebuilding parallel the bison in the 1700s, 1800s? Sure, sure. It, 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 it's, you know, we, we talk about, we talk about these issues and we, you know, we look at the, the population of these, of these animals, whether they're fish or bison or squirrels. You know, the, the older, larger fish are the first to be taken and they're the most productive. And so as you fish a stock down or as you hunt a stock down, you know, they can't rebuild any faster. And so without any controls on harvest, by the time an animal gets large enough to harvest, it's harvested and its reproductive capacity has been zero. And so, yeah, I think, I think there's no question. It's, it's a little more visible with bison on the plains and one of the biggest problems we've all, I've always had this problem with marine fisheries for my entire career is the fact that you can't look out in the sound and see that there are no fish there. You just see the top of the water. So imagine what some of these areas must have looked like 30 years ago, 40 years ago before the wholesale destruction. You know, if you could see it like we could see a forest cut down with no critters there. You know, if you could see that out here, I think you'd be shocked at what you see. Um, but we're not gonna be able to see that. So a lot of people see it out of sight, out of mind, and they they move on to the next issue. Well, thank you, Lewis. Um, and thank you to the both of you. Um, we are right at the top of the hour. So we've had a lot of questions and this has been a great chat today. So if anyone wants to stay in touch, you can sign up for the Sound Solutions emails and you can go to ncwf.org ncwf.org and you can sign up there and we give updates on all these topics that we are talking about here today and thank you Chris um, for that nice chat um, and we just appreciate all of you being being on here today we'll have other webinars coming up soon this was a ton of fun thank you to all of you who were on all three of them um, this this has been really great and I'll turn it back over to Lewis if you'd like to add any last thoughts today I just, yeah, I just thank everybody for being on here for very respectful and 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 nice questions. Um, you know, your support is critical for moving forward with these issues. And and I just a shout out to the Federation um, and, and our efforts. Um, I'm proud to be a part of that effort. And um, I think we're doing good things. And I hope you will keep in touch and, and keep abreast of the things that are going on and and and, and write that letter write that letter, make those phone calls and see if we can't make something happen. We're watch the legislature. We got things moving and, um, you know, don't just sit back and think it's going to happen without your help because we need it desperately. So thank you all for attending. Okay. Thank you everyone and have a great day.